My nightmare mother-in-law ruined our holiday, and my spineless husband refused to stand up to her. I endured their mistreatment afterwards for too long, but then one day I finally snapped. I was ready for the perfect getaway, but instead, I found my mother-in-law at the airport, thanks to my lying husband. So my husband John and I had been planning this dream vacation abroad for months. I worked overtime, skipped out on dinners with friends, and saved up every spare dollar. It was supposed to be just the two of us. But there was one problem. My mother-in-law, Susan. She's never liked me, and she loves to undermine me. She always caught copies my outfits, criticizes everything I do, and makes snide remarks at family gatherings. When she found out about the trip, she immediately started demanding to come with us. I said no politely at first, but then more firmly after she threw tantrums and threatened to disown my husband if he didn't include her. After weeks of arguments, he finally agreed that this was our trip, and we wouldn't bring her. Fast forward to the airport. I was excited to go until I saw her with luggage. It turns out my husband bought her a ticket behind my back. I couldn't even speak. I was so upset. I turned around, walked straight out, and went home. He followed me, yelling that I ruined everything, and then called my family, who said I should have just sucked it up and gone. When he came home an hour later, all hell broke loose. He started yelling at me, saying it was pathetic and spiteful of me to ruin the trip last minute. I tried to defend myself, but he just wouldn't stop yelling, and he eventually did something I never thought he was capable of doing. He raised his fist at me, he balled it up and held it in the air, but then put it down. He never laid hands on me in the end, but that single act was enough for me to rethink everything. I told him that if he ever does that again, I was out of this relationship, and he quickly quickly apologized, saying he doesn't know what came over him. For the next few days, the tension in the house was unbearable. John continued to act as though nothing was wrong. He made no real apology or acknowledgement of anything. Instead, he kept insisting that I was blowing things out of proportion. We barely spoke for days, and when we did, it was a surface-level conversation about work or the weather. Then, three days after the airport incident, Susan showed up unannounced. I wasn't surprised. She had a way of inserting herself into every situation, even when she wasn't wanted. I opened the door to her standing there with that same smile she always wore when she was up to something. She walked in without even waiting for an invitation, saying she was there to make amends. I braced myself, thinking maybe she'd offer some sort of apology. But no. Instead, she walked into my living room and immediately started rearranging things. She moved my couch, shifted my favorite vase to another table, and even adjusted the picture frames on the wall. I stood there in disbelief, biting my tongue because I knew that if I said anything, it would lead to another fight with John, and I was exhausted. I just wanted peace. So I stayed silent, hoping that once she'd finished her little makeover, she'd leave. But the damage was already done. John came home while she was still there. I waited for him to say something, to defend me, or at least acknowledge that Susan had overstepped. But after he saw the look on my face, all he said was, she's just trying to help. That was the moment I realized John wasn't on my side. Every time I tried to set boundaries with Susan, he was the one to let her cross them. I thought about confronting Susan and telling her to leave and never come back. It would be no point because John would defend her, just like he always did. That night, I barely got any sleep. My mind kept replaying everything that had happened. The next morning, I decided to take a drive to clear my head. I didn't know where I was going, but I needed to get out of the house. While on the road, I passed a small cafe I hadn't noticed before. Needing a break, I stopped for coffee. As I sat down, my phone buzzed with a message from an old friend I hadn't spoken to in years. She was going through a rough patch in her own marriage and wanted to catch up. I didn't think much of it at the time, but I replied and set up a time to meet later that week. The meeting with her turned out to be eye-opening. She told me about her own struggles with her husband's family, how she'd felt suffocated and neglected. Her story was eerily similar to mine, except she had already made the decision to leave. It was like looking into a mirror of what my life could become if I stayed. She had found happiness again after walking away from her marriage, and for the first time, I started to consider that maybe leaving was an option for me too. A week later was our wedding anniversary. I'd been quietly looking forward to this night despite everything. I'd spent hours planning a romantic dinner, setting up our favorite dishes, lighting candles, and trying to rekindle some sense of intimacy between us. Before I could call for John, Susan showed up again. I don't know how she found out about our plans, but there she was at the door just as I was finishing the final touches on our dinner. John welcomed her in with no hesitation. She immediately took over. She started taking the food I prepared off the stove. Susan insisted on helping us, which meant she would judge everything I made and then take over the cooking. I stood there watching helplessly as she added ingredients, spilled sauces, and rearranged the entire kitchen to her liking. John said nothing. The entire evening, she demanded his attention. She talked nonstop, sharing stories about their family, laughing at inside jokes that excluded me, and basically turning our anniversary into a celebration of her and John's bond. I felt invisible. Every time I tried to join the conversation, I was either ignored or dismissed. I didn't want another fight, especially on our anniversary, so I stayed quiet. When I quietly mentioned to John that this was supposed to be our night, I expected him to understand that what was happening wasn't okay. In 
Instead, he brushed me off with that same tone he always used when it came to her. My mom just wants to be part of it. You're overreacting again, he told me. I wanted to scream, but I didn't. I swallowed it down. He had already chosen her. He always would. That night, as I cleaned up the mess from dinner, I realized something. I wasn't just angry at Susan anymore. I was angry at myself. I had allowed this to happen. A few weeks after the disaster of our anniversary night, I was emotionally drained. I had been walking on eggshells not to bring up what happened that night to ruin our relationship. One evening, while John was out, I was sorting through some paperwork when I noticed something odd. It was a list of our personal expenses, credit card balances, and even details about our mortgage. What made my heart drop was that it wasn't in John's handwriting. It was in Susan's. She had gone through our finances. I confronted John that night. At first, he acted confused, as if he had no idea what I was talking about. But after pressing him, he finally admitted that he'd been discussing our finances with his mom for months, without telling me. She had been giving him advice on how we should be managing our money. He even admitted she suggested we sell our house and move closer to her. She said it would save us money and give us a fresh start. When I asked him why, his response was the same tired excuse I'd heard a thousand times. She just wants to help. There's nothing wrong with discussing our future with her. That night, the silence between John and me felt heavier than ever. I lay in bed awake and stared at the ceiling. He didn't see anything wrong with what he had done. He didn't understand how deeply it hurt that he had let his mother into the most private parts of our life. And worse, he didn't care. The next day, Susan started making subtle comments. She didn't waste any time wielding the information she had either. She started suggesting major changes to our spending habits. Every little thing I bought was suddenly scrutinized. Did we really need to spend that much on groceries? She asked me one day. Why not downgrade your car to something cheaper? She asked another day. And then, she started openly pushing the idea of selling the house. She casually mentioned it at every opportunity, acting like it was the best decision for us. When I confronted John again, asking how he could let her do this, he once again brushed it off. He said she was just concerned about our future and that he would try to talk to her if it was that much of an issue to me. I was talking to my old friend from the cafe, and she said the one thing that she wished she would have tried was therapy. I took that advice, and in a last attempt to save my marriage, I suggested couples counseling to John. Part of me still hoped that maybe John would finally wake up and see what his mother was doing to us. When I brought it up, he looked hesitant, but after some convincing, he agreed to give it a try. That small sliver of hope was enough to keep me going. Things finally started to look up. The day of our first therapy session came, and I was nervous but optimistic. I hoped the therapist could help us finally rekindle the spark that we had before, but just as the therapist called us in, the door swung open, and there was Susan. She walked in, smiling like this was her session too. My heart dropped. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. John had told her everything. He had told her about our decision to go to therapy. I didn't even have to ask. The look on his face said it all. He saw nothing wrong with her being there. In fact, he had probably invited her. My stomach churned as I realized just how deep this went. The session quickly turned chaotic. Susan immediately jumped into the conversation, claiming that she was only trying to be a part of our lives. She explained every boundary she had crossed and every moment she had inserted herself into our marriage, and John sat there nodding along. The therapist tried to mediate and suggested that maybe we needed to set clear boundaries. But John pushed back, saying that I was too sensitive and accused me of trying to isolate him from his family. The therapist's words were drowned out by Susan. I could barely focus. All I could hear was John taking his mother's side. It was too much. I walked out of the session feeling more alone than ever. The glimmer of hope I had felt was gone. The reality hit me hard. John wasn't going to change. No matter how much I begged or how much I tried to make him understand, Stand. He would always put his mother first. Days passed. I found myself pulling away even more. I wondered how much longer I could keep fighting this battle. But just as I was about to give up entirely, I got some news. I received a job offer. A big one. It was in another city. Hours away. But it was everything I had been working toward in my career. The pay was better. The opportunities were endless. And most importantly, it felt like a fresh start. I was excited. For the first time in what felt like forever, I felt a spark of hope. Maybe this job could be the fresh start John and I needed. I rushed home. I was excited excited to share the news with him. But when I told him, his reaction stunned me. Instead of the support I had hoped for, he shut it down immediately. He said we couldn't move because his mom wouldn't approve of it, and it was too far from family. The only family that lived in our city was his mom, so I knew he was only referring to her. I stood there, speechless. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. That was his reasoning for turning down a life-changing opportunity. I tried to reason with him. I begged him to see that this job could be the fresh start we needed. I pointed out how much it would benefit us financially, emotionally, and all around but his response crushed me. He said he wouldn't abandon his mom no matter what because she wouldn't do that to him. At that moment, everything became crystal clear. I would always come second to Susan. That was the breaking point. I couldn't pretend anymore. I decided to stop sacrificing my own happiness and self-worth 
just to stay in a marriage where I clearly wasn't respected or valued. I had fought for so long, but I realized I had been fighting alone. I made the decision to leave. Filing for divorce was one of the hardest things I've ever done, but I knew it was the only way to live the life that I deserved. I sat John down and explained that I couldn't stay in a marriage where I was constantly overshadowed and disrespected. I was made to feel like an outsider in my own home. He didn't understand, of course. He never would. He continued to blame me for the breakdown of our marriage. He refused to see how his own actions and his mother's constant interference had driven us apart, but I was done trying to make him see. The day I left, I felt a strange mix of sadness and relief. It hurt to walk away from the man I had once loved, but at the same time, I felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders I could breathe again. I accepted the job offer in the new city and packed up my things, ready to start over. In the aftermath, John continued to paint himself as the victim and told his family and mine that I had overreacted and that I was the one who had given up on our marriage. But deep down, I knew the truth. I hadn't given up. I had fought harder than anyone should have to. But there comes a point where you realize that you can't change anyone or make someone love you. Moving to the new city was the best decision I ever made. It wasn't easy, but it was necessary. I started my new job, and for the first time, in years, I felt like I was living my own life. And even though the scars of my marriage still hurt, I've found peace in knowing that I chose myself.